Lifted Up to Give Life. That's the title of the messages produced in the studios of Back to the Bible. Pastor Warren Wiersbe is the Bible teacher, and there are three messages in this series. Here's Pastor Wiersbe. It is night, and a leading Jewish teacher is making his way through the city of Jerusalem to see Jesus. The man's name is Nicodemus, and the man is perplexed. You'll find the record in John chapter 3. The Lord Jesus teaches Nicodemus as he would teach a child. He uses illustrations. He talks about birth. Nicodemus doesn't understand it. He talks about the wind blowing, and Nicodemus doesn't understand that. And then our Lord Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures that Nicodemus knew so well because he'd studied them, and he reminds Nicodemus of the story of the brazen serpent. Here's the record in John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.14 is the first of three references in the Gospel of John using the little phrase, lifted up. Our Lord is talking, of course, about his death on the cross. You'll find a second reference in John chapter 8 and verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. The third reference is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning at verse 31. Our Lord speaks and says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Then John adds this note, this he said signifying what death he should die. The death, of course, is the death of crucifixion. You'll notice there's an interesting combination here, an interesting parallel. According to John chapter 3, verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up that people might have life. Verse 15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross that sinners might have life. According to John 8:28, he was lifted up on the cross that sinners might know the truth. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. According to John chapter 12 and verse 32, our Lord was lifted up on the cross that he might draw all men in the way of salvation. I think you've already seen the parallel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross that he might open the way to draw all men. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross that he might reveal the truth. And Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross that he might provide the life. Let's look now at John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The historical record is found in Numbers chapter 21. I'll read it to you. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Speaking, of course, about the manna. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, 
And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. What then are the comparisons, the parallels, between our Lord being lifted up on the cross and that serpent of brass lifted up on the pole in the camp of Israel? Well, to begin with, both of them were provided to meet a great need. What was that great need? People were dying. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You see, they had sinned against Moses. They had criticized him. And they had sinned against God. They had criticized God. Here they were breaking the law, both tables of the law. The first table of the law speaks of our relationship to God. The second table of the law speaks of our relationship to man. And so the Jewish people had despised God's goodness. He had delivered them from Egypt. He was taking care of them, feeding them and leading them and protecting them. And what were they doing? They were complaining. Why? Because they wanted to live for eating and drinking. They wanted to live for the things of the flesh. You know, these Jewish people are a picture of our nations today, mankind today. They were wandering instead of being in the place of their inheritance. By their unbelief, they had disfranchised themselves for 40 years. 40 years of a funeral march. 40 years of people dying and being buried. A whole generation was going to die off. A new generation was going to have to come along and claim the inheritance, wandering in the wilderness, dying without hope, and rebelling against God. Now, the serpent of brass was provided to meet a great need. People were dying in the camp. I don't know if you've ever stopped to consider the finality and the reality of death. The great question you have to answer is, how do I prepare for death? Because all of us have sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. All of us have sinned against man, and we've sinned against God. We have broken both tables of the law, and we stand guilty before God, and we deserve to die. Both were provided to meet a great need. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only solution to the problem of death, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the Old Testament story, when the people looked at the serpent of brass, they were restored to health, but ultimately they would die. When by faith you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you aren't just experiencing a recovery. You experience a regeneration, a new birth. You receive eternal life and you cannot die. It has well been said that if you have been born only once, you will die twice. You see, if you have one birth, that's a physical birth, you will die physically and you will be dead spiritually for all eternity. The Bible calls this the second death. But if you've been born twice, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then the only possibility is that you can die once. You can die physically, but that means to be at home with the Lord. Both were provided to meet a great need. Do you know your great need today? Secondly, both were provided by God alone. Let's suppose that you and I were in the camp of Israel. We saw these fiery serpents slithering around. People were being bitten. People are dying. What would we have done to solve the problem? Well, human nature being like it is, I think the first thing we would have tried to do is reform the camp. Let's destroy the serpents. And we would have gotten ourselves... uh, swords and spears and clubs, and we'd, we would run around trying to destroy the serpents. And the more we destroy them, well, the more damage they would do. Now, I'm not against reformation. I think it's a good thing to clean things up. I think it's a good thing to get rid of all of this rot and garbage that exists in our cities today. But you know, you can take down all of these places of sin. You can get rid of all of these wicked things, and people's hearts are still wicked. They're still going to die in their sins. Reformation's not the answer. Somebody else says, well, let's make some medicine. And so they go to work to try to manufacture some kind of a serum self-effort. Oh, how many people there are who are trying to save themselves by their own self-effort. The medicine of man-made religion. And then there are those of a philosophical turn of mind who would say, well, let's just pretend they aren't there. 
Evil does not exist. These serpents don't exist. They are only the figments of your imagination. Well, while you are denying the existence of sin, it can kill you. Or let's pass a law against them. There are always those who are of a legislative uh, point of view. Let's pass a law. How can you pass a law to, to govern such things as sin and death? Or let's try to obey God's law. If we're good, maybe they won't touch us. But there's no amount of good works that can prevent the wages of sin. You see, both were provided by God alone. God provides the only Savior. Jesus Christ alone is the Savior. Not the law, not the ritual of the tabernacle, but not just Jesus Christ alone, Jesus Christ alone crucified. Not Christ the teacher, not Christ the example, not Christ the prophet, Christ crucified, lifted up on a cross. The Word of God says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. According to Galatians 3.13, when the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on that tree, he was bearing for us the curse of the law. The law that should have judged me judged him. And Christ was made sin for us and made a curse for us And now the gift of God's love is his son, Jesus Christ. Both were provided by God alone. I noticed that in the Old Testament story, the serpent didn't suffer. The serpent was made of brass. Jesus did suffer. I note that the serpent didn't die because it never had lived. But Jesus did die. Oh, the gift of God's love, his only begotten son. For God so loved the world, 56 times in the Gospel of John, you'll find the word loved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, 100 times you'll find that word believe in the Gospel of John, should not perish but have everlasting life. Both were provided to meet a great need. People were dying. Both were provided by God alone. Thirdly, both were provided to be accepted by faith. God said to the Jews, if by faith you'll look to the serpent, you will live. Jesus says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, dying sinners are helpless to do anything else. If God said, be baptized and you'll be saved, I can see people lying in the intensive care ward of the hospital. They cannot be baptized. Go out and obey the law. There are people who are unable to go out, and nobody can obey the law. The sinner is helpless to do anything else except entrust himself to a loving Savior. And you know, everybody knows how to believe. Everybody lives by faith in something, faith in their muscles or faith in their money or faith in their experience. Everyone lives by faith in something, and God's way of salvation is faith. I can imagine people in the Old Testament story listening to Moses saying, what a foolish idea. It seems so foolish. Put a a brazen picture of a serpent up on a pole and look at it. The preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness. Somebody else says, well, it's too simple. Yes, but it works. How humiliating, says the proud man. I'll work it my own way, and while he's working it his own way, he dies. And someone says, well, Moses, I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. Just do it. God makes it easy for you to be saved. That serpent was lifted up where all could see the serpent, right in the midst of the camp. And God gave a promise in his word, if you'll look, you will live. And the Jews saw it working in the lives of other people, and they said, why won't it work in my own life? Both were provided to meet a great need, and both were provided by God alone, and both were provided to be accepted by faith, and both worked when people believed. They were saved by a look. Now, you must remember, mankind was lost by a look, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food. That was the beginning of our downfall. We were lost by a look, and we are saved by a look. Look unto me, and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth is God's invitation. You see, looking is an evidence of faith. By believing God's word, they looked and they were cured. Now, when you look to Jesus Christ, you are saved. It's a look of faith. It's turning away from self and away from religion and away from all of our self-efforts 
looking to Jesus, not looking at Moses. We aren't saved by keeping the law. Not looking at the pole or the cross. We aren't saved by some religious symbol. Not looking at the snakes. No, no. Looking to Jesus Christ. And listen to the promise. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, never perish, but have right now everlasting life. The Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross that you might have life. There are three groups of people who cannot have this life. There are three groups of people that Jesus cannot save. Number one, those who will not admit that they have been bitten. They won't admit that they're sinners. They're dying, but they won't admit it. Jesus can't save them. Those who have not been told of the remedy, Jesus can't save them. That's why it's so important for us to get the message out. Those who have been told, but they will not look, our Lord Jesus cannot save them. There's life for a look in the crucified one. There's life at this moment for thee. If you have never looked by faith to Jesus Christ, let me remind you, he was lifted up on the cross that you might have life. The wages of sin is still death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.